Okay. Uh, yeah. And Crispin, to a little introduction on Crispin. He is the founder of PMM Hive, Product Marketing Hive, which is a community that shares free product marketing knowledge and offers different training, playbooks, templates. There's a really good Slack community too that uh, I highly recommend. And he's also the, the CEO of Product Marketing Edge, which is helping tech companies advance their product marketing capability through mentoring, training, and consultant as well. So, Chris, if you wanted to talk a little bit about Product Marketing Hive, and then we can jump into that, the presentation. Yeah, um, thanks, Adam, and thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me to, uh, uh, to speak. Um, yeah, so Product Marketing Hive, um, as Adam said, is a product marketing community, a product marketing community that gives back everything in product marketing. Hive is free. It's an opportunity to, uh, to connect with other product marketers, to access free training and resources, and just generally to share your success and, uh, uh, and sort of, you know, have fun. And so you can follow, uh, follow Product Marketing Hive on any of those social links. And what we're going to talk about today is, um, uh, is um, based on a positioning and messaging framework that there's, there's actually more detail. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to get it. If you want to get some more detail from Product Marketing Hive on that, you can do later. But, but we're, going to do, we're going to better do a good job of covering, covering a lot of ground today. And so the two, the two things we're going to be talking about, one is that, that are going to come up in the conversation that I thought I'd just level set on that right at the beginning. One is battle cards and one is product positioning and messaging. So I just thought it'd be useful if super quickly, I made sure everyone sort of knows what they are. And, and, and there's clear, of course, there's lots of material to educate people on, on battle cards, but just in case anybody's not familiar with them, a battle card is a place where you keep competitive insights about a particular competitor. And the, the purpose of it really is, is ultimately is to help you to win competitive deals against that competitor. So there's information on it like, why you win, why you lose, uh, objection handling, landmines, and quick dismisses. So I'm mentioning that because we are going to be referring to battle cards a little bit over the course of the session. The other thing, but the main thing we're going to be talking about is product positioning and messaging. And what I mean by product positioning and messaging is really the description of a product. So when you go to a website and you click on product, or someone hands you a brochure or gives you a fact sheet about a product, that is product positioning and messaging. And I'm going to be talking today about a way of doing product positioning and messaging in a way that enables you at the same time as you're describing the product to land a bunch of powerful competitive um, points as you just in, in a sort of transparent way um, without necessarily people even noticing uh, because they're just reading about the product. So we'll be talking about that. And the reason this is important, I think, is that especially if you're coming at this from a sort of competitive intelligence point of view, is that it gives you a complementary channel for getting competitive insights into the minds of the customer, which is ultimately the goal, right? So if you're doing, if you're doing um, you know, sort of competitive intelligence work, you're creating battle cards, your purpose with that, right, of course, is, is, is that the salespeople and other people in the company, but certainly and especially the salespeople, they look at those battle cards, they use the insights there as they interact with prospects, right? So carefully created product positioning and messaging gives you another channel for doing kind of the same thing, right? Because in the end, um, uh, you still want to have these competitive insights into the, uh, into the minds of the, of the customer. So product positioning and messaging gives you an additional channel. And it's a, it's a different kind of a channel. Uh, but ultimately, you know, the, the, the purpose is the same because you're trying, to, you're trying to drive your business and you're trying to win deals. And so we'll be, we'll be talking during this session about, first of all, how to do that product positioning and messaging in a way that lets you land sharp competitive messaging. We'll also be talking about some of the interaction that should probably exist more than it does today between the competitive intelligence world and the battle cards and the product positioning and messaging worlds. So on that, let's... Let's dive into this, but just before, just before we get into the actual framework, I want to talk a little bit about messaging and differentiation and a little, a little bit, a little bit of philosophy just for a couple of minutes before we get into the actual sort of main course. So first of all, we're talking about a positioning and messaging framework. And one of the important ideas behind, I think any positioning and messaging framework is that you're separating, building the messaging and the positioning from creating um, artifacts that use that positioning and messaging, right? So you're, you, you're making a concentrated effort on the positioning and messaging itself. Because if you think about it, the other way of doing this, if you, if, if you don't take this approach, the other way of doing it is, okay, you know, I'm going to write a fact sheet and then I'm going to write a brochure and then I'm going to write some web content. 
Um, and I'm going to say some, some good stuff in each of those. And then I'm going to say some more good stuff. And then I'm going to say some more good stuff, right? But is, is the stuff that you're saying consistent? Is it coherent? Is it the best way to, you know, to, 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 to frame your competitive position? Maybe not because you didn't spend maybe as much time thinking about it as you could have done. So the, 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 one of the main benefits of separating these processes is that if you're working on the positioning and the messaging for your company's main product, maybe your company only has one product, um, it could be your company's only product, or it could be one of one of two or three products. If you're doing that exercise and you say to the CEO, to whoever you think are the sort of top minds in the company, you're going to be busy people out in sales or, or in product or whatever, and say, look, would you like to come together and spend maybe a day or two days even working on the positioning for the company's core product? You know, do you think that's a good use of your time? The answer is going to be yes, of course, it's a good use of my time. We're talking about, you know, the, the fundamental positioning of the core product of the company. So, so the, the point is that's sort of worth people's time working on that. Whereas not, the same is not true of, of writing a fact sheet, writing a bit of web copy, writing a brochure. You can't get the same minds on it, right? Um, the other advantage of doing this, of course, is that if you work on the positioning and messaging separately, then you have consistency because all of these downstream artifacts are going to be are going to be using using the same messaging and, and positioning and it also makes sales enablement easier so that's some of the reasons why it's important to have a framework uh, that you use for uh, for product positioning and messaging now let's be it's a tiny a tiny bit philosophical for a second and and uh, um, ask ourselves what is a marketing message and I think and I believe it was uh, my friend Dave Kellogg who, um, uh, who who pointed this out to me. A marketing message, and I think this is a really good definition of a marketing message. A marketing message is an answer to a question. Hmm. Very interesting. So, so then, of course, it becomes very important to think as you're creating the marketing message, think about what is the question that you're answering? In other words, what question is your audience asking you? So two, two examples here on the screen, both about CRM. Let's imagine that we're selling a CRM product. One question is, what are the business benefits of CRM? Another different question is, why should I buy your CRM application? Two questions, two different questions, calling for a different set of marketing messages. So I think it's, it's interesting to think about different, different sorts of market and, and what kinds of questions people are asking in those kinds of, kinds of markets so that you can make sure you're answering the questions that people are actually asking. So I like to talk about hot and cold markets. Uh, where a hot market is is a market with active buyers. It's a market with a lot of competition. It's like most of the markets you've probably ever heard of are hot markets. CRM is a hot market. Business intelligence is a hot market. Really, any market with a lot of active with a lot of activity, a lot of players, a lot of competition, and a lot of active buyers, that's a hot market. And then there's also there are also cold markets. Um, cold markets are markets where no one is looking for your solution. <laughs> um, sounds a little sad, but then. Um, there was a there's a there's a book what's it called the blue ocean strategy right would you rather be in a blue ocean or a red ocean well i'd rather be in a blue ocean well, certainly I'm, i live near the ocean and i wouldn't want to go in it if it was red um there's a good name for a book isn't it like blue ocean strategy it's because it, like it sounds it sounds it sounds right <laughs> no one wants a red ocean and yet and yet a lot of us are playing in red oceans right from a competitive point of view in fact someone someone did did a little bit of research they looked at all the most recent SaaS companies that were started in the last few years and 70 percent of them are in established categories they're in hot markets and we can understand why right it's a hot market so of course it attracts investment of course it attracts new entrants of course it attracts lots of people right so many of us are working in hot markets and you know i also on this chart i also differentiate between being the dominant market leader and being someone else and of course most of us are someone else right by definition in any market not all markets have a dominant market leader but some do and so the point about this is that the 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 type of marketing you do differs based on which square you sit in here. And if you're a challenger in a hot market, which most people are, your fundamental marketing purpose is to differentiate. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. There's different techniques that apply in, in other situations, like in cold markets. But this is interesting, right? Because if, you're, if, you're, if your goal is to differentiate, then some of the sort of marketing truisms, the marketing things that, that, that people say that sound right, don't, if you think about it, they might not be right. Like, for example, oh, you know, we shouldn't be talking about features. We shouldn't be talking about, about, about the product. We should be talking about the business benefit. I mean, that sounds right, right? Of course, we should be talking about the business benefit, but should you? Let's, let's, let's think about this in a, um, uh, in, a, in, in a particular situation. Let's think about the CRM market, right? You're in the CRM market. It's a hot market. You're not number one. You're not Salesforce. You're someone else. Should you be talking about the business benefits of CRM? 
sounds good. But then you think about what's the question that your, that your audience is asking? Who is your audience? Who's coming to your website? Who's buying CRM systems? Think about it. What's the answer to that question? There are people who know a lot about CRM actually, aren't they? If, you, if you're in a company and you said to someone, go buy, go buy a new CRM system, it's probably someone in sales operations who's implemented three or four CRM systems before, who knows the space inside out, who has hands-on experience with a couple of different systems. And now as a marketer, who knows less, much less about the topic than, than, than he does, you're going to explain to him what the business benefits are. Wait, let me explain to you what the business benefits are. That's nonsense, right? I mean, it doesn't need to know from you what the business benefits of CRM are. So because the question that person would be asking is why should I buy CRM from, from you? The question is about the difference between your product and someone else's. So we're in hot markets. And so the rest, we're going to talk about how to do this, how to describe a product in a hot market um, in a way um, which is going to be compelling and clear and consistent. So we're going to start with a positioning statement. So um, a positioning statement for a product, this is very classic, goes back you know, decades and decades. It's still just as valid today as it ever was. Um, and I think almost everybody agrees with that. There's a couple of people who might not. But the, the general form of the positioning statement is for target buyers, product name is the category that benefit. And I say Uber benefit here just because that's my sort of top benefit and we're gonna come across other benefits later. So that's a positioning statement. It tells you in one sentence, it's super powerful. It's a super powerful statement because it's one sentence and it tells you what the name of the product is, what it does and why you should care in one sentence. So if anyone doesn't think we should be using positioning statements, I'm really curious as to know what is the one sentence that we should be using that's not a positioning statement to describe a product. It's like the ultimately short elevator pitch where you don't have to stop the elevator. You can give a lot of information very, very quickly. It's a very powerful statement. It's a very helpful navigational statement as well because, because you do let people know immediately what you do and what you don't do. So. And uh, now category, the, let's talk a little bit about category because you know I feel like I talk a lot about categories um, in positioning statements, but I feel like I have to because this is, you know, it's like the first thing that you see right after the name, then the category. So if you get this bit wrong, you're off to a terrible start, right? You're off to a really bad start because it's like that's the second word uh, that anyone sees from what you do. So categories, the, the point about, we're gonna, we'll be talking a lot about differentiation. And so it's very important for everyone to understand where do you differentiate? And key takeaway, category is not where you differentiate. Because differentiate, to differentiate, you have to be different. So different from who, right? So, so the category is who you're different from. So in, in a sense, you have to sort of be the same before you can be different. The Uber benefit, that's the differentiation. The category is differentiation from who? This is my group. This, this is my point of reference. This is, my, this is the people I'm standing out from. So if you make a mistake and you, you know, which happens so much, it happens so often um, that people don't use the category that they're actually in for various reasons. If you, if you refuse to admit that you're in the category that you're in, chaos um, ensues because it becomes very difficult for people to understand sort of even what you do. And I've seen many times, more times than not, I've seen companies in established categories abandon the category name. And I think, and I try to understand why, I think one reason is because they're bored um, because you know they've been doing, they've been marketing that category for you know for ten years, and it gets boring after a while. I mean, they may be bored. Doesn't mean that the, the rest of the world is bored uh, with their marketing. And there's another thing that I've definitely come across quite often, which is, which is, but wait, wait, wait. But that's such a narrow definition of what we do. We do so much more. You can't put me into the CRM category. We do so much more than that. We have all these extra features, and you know, and and, and you hear this especially obviously in software. But like, if you think about it, wait a minute, but that's, but that's because it's software. Like, of course it does more. It's like software can always do more. And if it doesn't do more today, it wouldn't take much to make it do more. So that's really not a reason to abandon your category. Um, my advice there is to just sort of, you know, get over that. And, and the more that you do is your differentiation. So it's always much better if you can anchor yourself if you can anchor yourself to a category and then differentiate. Now, there are some very advanced cases where you can create a new category, but like 99 times out of 100, when I've seen people do this, it's just wrong. It's a mistake. It's not clever category creation. Look, here's an example. Now, I'll give you a positioning statement. Monday.com is a work operating system or a work OS. Monday.com is a work OS. Now, on the call, there's two kinds of people. There's the kind of people who know what Monday.com is, and there's the people who don't know what monday.com is. The people who knew what monday.com is, they still know what monday.com is. The people who didn't know what it is, they still don't know what it is, 
right? So that positioning statement has achieved absolutely nothing, except probably confuse people. Adam, do you know what Monday.com is? I do not. Ah. And I still okay. don't. Okay, so guess. Monday.com. I'm going to say, considering we've talked about a, a software service, something, a calendar, a work calendar or something like that. Okay. 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 So yeah. So if you don't know, you don't know, I guess. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of the point. It's a, it's a project tracker. It's like, it's like a simple project management system. I mean, it's quite a lot of people use it in marketing and, it, and it's, and it's lovely, right? It's colorful. It's a very nice product. There's nothing wrong with the product at all. Um, but it's positioned as a work operating system because project management is too boring. Right. Um, but, you know, but but that's such a missed opportunity, right? Because it's like that's your one line elevator pitch. You can do so much right in, in, in one line. You can convey so much information. And in that particular case, and I don't want to pick on Monday.com, but I do anyway, because, you know, I, I, I just love the example. Um, nothing is achieved in that in that positioning statement. So that's why, you know, pick, picking the right category is so important. Now, the, the, the place in the positioning statement where you differentiate is this is this Uber benefit. That's the, and this, uh, that is the, that is the one reason why your product is better than everyone else's. It's the one thing. If you had to pick one thing and you have to here, if you had to pick one reason why people should choose your product, just one, then what is it? It's this Uber benefit. So of course it has to be differentiated, but it, but you know, really you're looking for something which is, which is even more profound than that. It's like, um, there's this notion of vectors of differentiation that I like, a vector of differ differentiation. It's, it's, it's differentiation in motion. It's the idea that, yes, this is a differentiator today in version 2.6.1 of my product, but it's also strategic. It's going to be a differentiator uh, in, in three years. If someone copies everything I've done and they release it tomorrow, they'll still be behind because this is so important to the identity of the company, to the identity of our product. It's like, you know, this is like the, it's like the, the sort of differentiated essence of a product. That's ideally what you're looking for. In, in an Uber benefit in a positioning statement. And, and it should also, and, and in a sense, it sort of rolls up the other messages. We'll be talking about some other messages that we can, that we can uh, include too. And it's a sort of roll up of those. So if you think about this in terms of competitive intelligence, you know, if you're looking at your battle cards for your number one competitor, your number two competitor, you're looking at the why we win. If, number, if, if you're number one, number two, and number three competitors, there's a pattern around why we win. Is that, is that the Uber benefit perhaps, maybe? Um, so, so, you know, that's a very, 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 very important piece of your marketing. So let's just look, look at a couple of examples here. There's a couple of cases we haven't talked about. So I'll just jump onto those straight away. That's number three and four. Those two examples, they are, uh, they're, they're subcategorizing and claiming leadership, subcategorizing, claiming leadership. When I say don't invent a category, I don't mean don't subcategorize. That's actually, a, that's a clever trick. It's the oldest marketing trick in the book. And it's a good one, right? It's like, you take a category, you subcategorize it until you're the leader, and then you say, I'm the leader. It's just clever, right? So like model three, the category is vehicle, the subcategory electric vehicle, the sub subcategory mass market electric vehicle, hey, it's the first. I mean, that's a highly debatable statement, by the way, when you look at the price of a model three. But anyway, that was, that was how Tesla used to position it. Uh, there's another one there, which is a roadmaster, which is a weather solution for, 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 for roads. It's the world's leading winter road weather solution. It's not the world's leading weather solution but it is the leading, the world's leading winter road weather solution. So it's a subcategorization and leadership claim. So that's, that's lovely. But if you look at the others, you know, they fit our pattern. They fit our pattern better. The last one is particularly clear. Empathy is the commerce search and discovery platform you can trust. Commerce search and discovery, what's that? Whenever you go and buy something online and you click in the search box and you start typing, well, uh, your experience will vary. Um, but if it's using a great product, it's going to be an, an inspiring, it's going it's to immediately start thinking about options, it'll be presenting things to you, it'll be, it'll be animated, it'll be beautiful, it'll be inspiring. That's commerce search and discovery on a good day, like empathy. You can trust, that's, that's the fundamental benefit of it. So oh, you can trust, trust, how interesting. So you'll notice that, you know, good positioning statements, they, they tend to make very bold claims, very differentiated claims. They, that's all they do. They, 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 they don't tell the rest of the story. That's not what they're for. They don't answer every question. They're, they're more of a provocation. It's like, what do you mean? You know, that it's, it's the search and discovery solution you can trust. Well, funny, you should ask, you know, because the rest of my marketing is going, is going to answer that question for you. So those are examples of positioning statements, which are well-crafted, which, you know, which, which, which help people to understand what you do and also sort of, you know, why, why you're different. Now, 
So that's a positioning statement. And I have to talk about that because if you get that wrong, then, you know, it can be, it can be really be an uphill struggle after that to sort of recover. Now, here's where some interesting magic happens. This is the key messages and proof points. Now, if I, if I, if I step back just for a second and we sort of think about, um, uh, if we thought, okay, I need to describe a product, simple blank sheet of paper, describe a product, what would you in intuitively do? Well, you, you'd say, okay, well, then I'll put the name of the product at the top and I might say what it is, like the category. So I have, you know, Hive CRM is a CRM application. And then to describe a product, logically, you're gonna start writing about features, right? Because that's, that is the sort of atomic structure of a product. Products are made of features. So it would make sense to start writing about features, right? And that's not what we're doing here. It's not the next thing that we're doing here. You have to get to features because products are made of features. But what we're saying here is that no, the next thing, the next thing is not features. The next thing that we're gonna think about and communicate, think very hard about and then communicate very clearly are the fundamental competitive advantages of your product. And as this diagram might suggest, those are actually going to wrap up features in a minute, but we'll get there soon. Now, so. What we're looking for is three key messages. And in a competitive market, these are three advantages. They're comparative, they're differences between what you have and your competition has. Now, remember, there's a difference between what we're doing here and battle cards. A battle card is about one competitor. This is your website. So what you can't do here is you can't write one version of this for every competitor. It's just, you click on product on the website. I hand you a brochure. This is the content. So there's a lot of interesting artistic effort and thought that has to go into which are those top three if i could only say three things about my product um what we're doing here is like what medical people would call triage i'm trying to do the most good to the most people i can't i, I can't save every deal right with this right um i'm trying to do the most good for the most people so think, thinking about my top competitors my top scenarios how i win why do i lose what are those three key messages that i can deliver about my product that are, gonna, that, are, that are gonna do the most good for me. Um, and so if you think about, you know, just referring back to CI, so the way that you would develop this, right, is probably gonna be in a workshop environment with people in the company who are best at this and have the most knowledge of this. And this is selling, it's the competition, it's why we win, why we lose. They might be from sales, they might be solution consultants, they might be, you know, the, they could be the founders. Um, but you get those people in the room and you really say, you can only pick three. And of course, you know, those people, you know, they can come up with lots, right? They can come up with dozens of them, but what are the three? What are the three top reasons? And if you wanted to sort of sanity check some of this and you, and you have some battle cards, you could look in your battle cards. You could say, you know, why do, why do we win in those, in those, with those top competitors? Are there some landmines we should be thinking about? Should we be reframing some, some objections? Why do we lose? It's like, because very often these are going to be based on your competitive strengths, right? Let's say, um, you know, typically you win deals because you know, because your product is your product is uh, is powerful and it's and it's and it's and it's easy to deploy at scale, for example. So you got powerful, you got easy to deploy, for example. But let's say so. Very often, those key messages are going to be landing those points in a very clear, very deliberate way. Sometimes, and this is much more, this is more unusual, but occasionally there might be a reason why you keep losing. Like you might be losing a lot of deals and, and, and it's like always the same reason. Let's say you have an annoying competitor who, you know, you think their product is not very good. It's a bit of a toy, but everyone agrees it's easy to use, right? So when they win, they win because it's easy to use, even though it's not very well featured. So how do you handle that? How do you handle that as a marketer? You could say, okay, if anyone mentions ease of use, cover your ears and duck, you know, or, you know, how do you, what are you going to do? It's like, should you keep quiet about it? Should you try and avoid the topic? Or there's an alternative, even if you know it's a weakness, you can actually use it as a marketing message because you could try to reframe the conversation around ease, ease of use. And actually, this, this, this comes to my mind because I've done it in the past. It was quite a while ago, but I had an annoying competitor in the business intelligence space. They were easier to use. So we put ease of use as one of our key messages and we defended it because we had capabilities in our product that did make it relatively easy to use. So what we were trying to do there is muddy the waters. We were trying to deny differentiation to a competitor. So you can either use these to communicate your differentiation or you can use them to deny differentiation. So, yeah, I mean, so, so you know, someone comes back and says, oh yeah, but this other thing is so easy to use. It's not easy to use, you know, it's 1995, everything's easy to use. You know, come on, ours is easy to use. We've got these features too. Um, anyway, so, so those are the, sort of the, the kinds of things that you're gonna end up having in these, in these key messages. 
Um, a few examples. So powerful, easy to use, fast to deploy. You know, just 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 mention that one. But they could be more businessy. Uh, reduce spend on goods and services, streamline procurement processes, enforce policy compliance. Are those differentiated? Well, you'd have to know the application. You'd have to know the space to know that. But let's assume that they were. Um, the most accurate, the most reliable, and the most innovative. Those certainly sound like they're differentiated because they're claims of superiority. Trust, understanding, and joy. Feelings. Can feelings be differentiators? I learned quite recently that yes, they can. <laughs> they can. And you can, and you can prove that, that uh, a commerce search and discovery solution you know, can differentiate itself on those, uh, on the, on those areas. So, so key, key messages, a great opportunity to land these, these competitive messages. Um, and so now under, under each of these, um, under each of these key messages now, cause that was just a claim, right? So, so far, all you've done is make claims, right? You've said, okay, my product is in this category, which is a fact. And then you've just done, you've done nothing but claim. It provides this Uber benefit, you know, it does this, it does that. This, all you've done is make claims. So now it's really is time. You have to prove those claims to be true, right? Otherwise what you have is not, is not good marketing. What you have is just, you know, fluff. It's just nonsense. So that's where proof points come in. And, and so how do you prove, how do you prove a claim to be true? You prove a claim with a fact. It has to be a fact. And so if it's software, um, which, you know, I do a lot of software, then it's a feature. But this, this framework works in exactly the same way. And I have an example from financial services, not fintech, financial services. The framework is exactly the same. You know, you just talk about attributes of a service or it works with anything. But in, in software, it's going to be a feature because a feature is a fact. But it doesn't have to be a feature. It could be, you know, let's say, if you're claiming that, that your product can be deployed quickly, hey, I can deploy it in eight to 12 weeks. That's a fact. That's not a claim. So, so this is this is this is what the proof points are for. They're for they're for supporting the key messages, for demonstrating them to be true. So, if you think about the whole process behind this, then rather than start, rather than starting with a blank sheet of paper, writing down a bunch of features, the process you're going through is probably okay. I'm going to think about what my what my three key points of difference are, what my three key messages are, and then I'm going to go looking for features to prove them, right? And what if I can't find features to prove them? Well, if you can't find features to prove them, they were probably never advantages in the first place, whether they were entirely in your own imagination. So, so try again. Um, but if, if they're real advantages, there will be proof, right? So, so it's a different process, right? Start with the advantage and then look for the proof. The proof is features and that is your product. That is the description of your product. And so, you know, examples. And so, uh, so it's the feature that proves the key message. So, so why do we put a benefit here in the proof point too? Um, the, the, the reason is to simply why not, right? If you've got a feature or a fact, it has a benefit at its own little micro level. So it would be rude not to include it. That's why this is a feature. This is a feature benefit pair, you know, expressed usually in the form of feature gives you benefit or benefit with feature, lower sales costs with a robust internet storefront or a robust internet storefront lowers your sales costs. So there's a feature benefit pair here. So, um, uh, and where might you find these? They might be, there might be landmines. Here's a, here's a, here's a few examples. Point and click setup. That's a feature makes finance self-sufficient. That's a benefit. Imagine this is in some kind of a financial application, right? Let's say you're in the financial planning space, um, and your competitors to set the whole thing up, they need developers, but your system doesn't finance. People can do it on their own. Finance is self-sufficient. Fantastic, right? That's a clear statement, and, and that's going to prove some bigger point, right? Um, uh, which you know, which which uh, which would be in the message above it. Click through onboarding, immediate deployment to all chosen suppliers. That is uh, that is uh, financial services. That's a supply chain financing system for basically a bank. Uh, now, look at a, so there's more examples here, but look at look at a couple of. Um, a couple of a couple of other uh, uh, asterisks uh, ones here. We have sensitive data watcher and my plan. So they're different from the others, right? Um, they're different because they're named features. So named features. So that's a really interesting topic, right? Is like when should you name features? Because sometimes people name features, right? Like my plan. Apple. If there's anyone on the call from Apple, you name features too much. <laughs> Please stop. Stop it, okay? <laughs> it's like, look, there's the, even Siri doesn't know what any of your name features do, right? You can ask Siri. Ask Siri what is, uh, I don't know, uh, expose. Siri doesn't know how to expect us to know, okay? So, and by the way, Siri is another example. So, Spotlight, which you could, anyway, look. Um, uh, so, naming, so why, why would you really want to name a feature? And I, I've thought about this quite a bit. 
And I think the answer is this. The answer is you want to give a, give a feature a cute name only if you want to talk about it. If you want to talk about it a lot, because you view it as a kind of a very critical, competitively important feature that you want people to talk about, it's probably a landmine that you're leaving for people. It's some like super key feature. And so let's say, let's take, let's take this example of my plan. My plan lets business users plan the way they work. This is, this is from a financial budgeting planning type application. So what's my plan? My plan lets the business users make their own plans in a very simple, easy way. And then it gets integrated back into the big planning system on the back end. Sounds useful, right? So my plan, the, idea, the intent here is to, is to like plant this idea because it's unusual. Most, most planning systems don't have it. So if this works successfully, then after you've spoken to your prospective customer and then the competitor speaks to them, they're saying, okay, 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 okay. That's nice. That's nice. Yeah, that's nice. Do you have like, do you have something like my plan? Do you have, do you have like this way to, to let people, you know, plan the way they work, you know, in, in, in a natural way. So you're trying to leave this idea in someone's head and naming it and talking about it more than you probably should is the method for that. You're also turning a molehill into, into a mountain a little bit by doing this. So talk about it a lot, name it, make it an issue, get it on the agenda. That's a sort of landmine laying technique for features. Now, the key thing here is, is if that's not what you're doing, don't name them because you're just using up cognitive capacity in your buyer for nothing. So don't name a bunch of features that you don't want to have a big conversation about because it's just wasting, you're wasting space in, in someone else's head, okay? Just be very direct and very simple. And sometimes you have, you have a really powerful feature that it's still better not to name. I'll give you one example on this because actually from this, this is, this is, these are taken from various places, but, but go up to Excel formula language. That's, that's actually from the, same, from the same product, I think. Excel formula language and user experience, that's not a named feature. But it is actually for that company and that product, just as important as my plan, probably more important than my plan. So why wasn't that a named feature? The reason that wasn't a named feature is the point about that feature was Excel. Because again, we're in this financial space. We're saying, hey, wait a minute. We have a solution that uses Excel formula languages. And these other guys, they have to do programming or something, which you don't know how to do, but you do know how to do Excel. Therefore, this is good, right? So the word you want to have in people's heads there is Excel, right? It's not, it wouldn't help if you, if you renamed it and gave it a cute name, okay? So, so to, be, to be used with caution, that's to say that the trade-off with giving a cute name is that it might make it less obvious what it is. And sometimes you want it to be obvious, okay? So those are proof point examples. So all of this comes together to, to create this, this message tree. I call this an advantage-based an advantage message tree. And what is very powerful with this structure is that it's just so good for landing compelling competitive messages because the first few things that you say, right? And that just let's just step back for a minute and say that this, this is like a, a structural diagram, right? Of, of the, of the framework, but imagine in real life, what does this look like? This is, this is the product description on your website. The key messages are the categories, you know, your three sections on your website. Those are the section headings in a brochure. These are, let's say a three page brochure. These are the titles on the top of the page, these key messages, right? Uh, in, in PowerPoint, depending on how many slides you have, you know, they're, they're, they're the slide headings, right? These are super visible. They're everywhere. You can't, you cannot, possibly, you know, get any information at all about the product without seeing these competitive messages. They're everywhere. They're just transmitted constantly. And that's why people don't even notice that they're, that they're being competitively marketed at. This is simply the description of the product, right? Um, and so that's what makes this so powerful. It's a very subtle way of injecting very powerful competitive messages into every single touch point you have with a customer. Um, so they're great for landing um, uh, competitive messages. But the other thing that's nice about this is, is what you've also done at the same time, even though you've added information to a, to a simple list of features, you've actually also simplified it from a communication point of view. Because instead of anyone having to remember or navigate through or juggle with 10 features, you've just given them three messages. So it's actually, it's actually a much more crisp and clear and shorter way to communicate as well. You, um, and yeah, okay, the, 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 it's memorable. Someone, someone can remember those three messages. They may not remember all of the proof points behind each of the messages, but that really doesn't matter because they remember that you proved them. They remember the messages and they remember they were true because they saw proof. So this, this is very good. It, it works very well with the way that, the way that people's, people's heads work. And if I didn't talk about this before, why three messages? Because if you, if you use three messages, then you are choosing the three things that the person is gonna remember. If you use 10 messages, you're not choosing the three things the person is going to remember. And so you have inconsistency and chaos, right? So that's why, that's why three. 
Um, so those are message trees. So, I mean, we can just very, very quickly, um, very quickly, we'll just you know look at look at one example. There's going to be a couple more in the in the in the slides that, that you can peruse you know at your leisure. I think I'll, I'll think I put four four examples in here. This is this is one which is for a what used to be called an EPM, an enterprise performance management platform, does sort of financial planning and stuff, um, also some consolidation. Uh, the brand, the brand doesn't exist anymore. The company still does, but the brand was Host Analytics, is the connected financial planning and closed platform. Bit of a mouthful that evolves with your business. Host Analytics is the connected financial planning and closed platform that evolves with your business. Host Analytics, uh, name of the platform, evolves with your business. The benefit, the the capacity of this particular um, financial system to to deal with change, right? So so you have a whole narrative leading into this, we're not going to talk about narrative positioning now, but if we did, we'd talk about a whole narrative leading into this idea of how businesses are constantly changing. And therefore, that's why, that's, a, that's why transition, that's why we created host analytics, the connective that evolves with your business. That's a, that's why transition from a narrative. Okay. So, so, so that's, and so, so what we do then is, is, is we sort of, we, we make a case here. We sort of prove, okay, what does it take to be able to, to evolve as your business changes? Well, it has to be powerful enough to ha to handle that what you need today, but also what you need in the future. It has to be easy to use. Otherwise, you know, the whole thing's doomed. And of course it must be faster to deploy because if your business changes, you know, every, every three months and it takes two years to deploy the change. Right. So, so you're making a case here. So look, it's super simple. It evolves the business. It's powerful, easy to use, faster to deploy. And then you still have all the, you didn't lose any information in here. You've just simply grouped it up. You've organized it in people's heads and you've tried to, you know, and, and, and in the case of this particular company, they'd be competing with some other guys. And the claim they would make is that, okay, there's some other guys out there who are powerful. There's some other guys out there who are easy to use, but we're the ones who are powerful and easy to use and faster to deploy. So that's the, the sort of a, the uh, uh, one of those examples. There's another one here, which we won't go through now because I, I think we can we can take we can take some questions in a minute. But let me just uh, final final thoughts on on sort of drawing the connections between between the battle cards and the uh, and the positioning and messaging, and then and then we can, then we can get into questions. So. Um, so yeah, of course, the key thing, of course, is that there's more battle cards than there is product positioning. So you have to sort of, you know, choose your battles. You have to, you have to focus on the most common and most impactful scenarios. So you'll be looking at your, your battle cards. Why do we win? Why do we lose? Landmines, objection handling. Objection handling is an interesting one. So let's say competitors are constantly planting this, you know, this objection you have to deal with in sales. Why don't you pre-handle it right here? Pre-handle it, find out what that is and just go after it, attack. Um, so one way to prehandle it, the most aggressive way to prehandle it, I suppose, would be with a key message. But you could also prehandle it with a proof point, right? Quick dismiss is interesting. As you know, so, um, battle cards often include this idea of a quick dismiss. It's like, um, so you know, you could you could you could be positioning your solution, for example, into a certain market category. Let's say you know we have we have CRM for the enterprise, um, uh, and. So if you're competing with someone who's more of a departmental player, then it's like, oh, wait a minute, just no. I mean, you shouldn't be talking to us both. It's like, we're the enterprise guys, they're the departmental guys, you know, which, which do you want? Because you know, you know, I, think, I think that your company is an enterprise, don't you? I don't think it's a small business. So, you know, um, so, so you can, you know, quick dismiss can, can sort of apply at the positioning statement level as well as the messages. So, and just, um, and, and a good thing to do, I think, is, is to use battle cards as a sort of a checklist. Now, if you've got some draft messaging and positioning, okay, now let's let, we've got some, this, this looks good, we feel good about it. Let's just look at some battle cards and see if we, see if we really feel like we're checking off the boxes that we should do. Um, so yeah, flowing through that way. Which, you know, which, uh, which direction this flows in, it, there's, there's a, a little bit of a chicken and an egg here, not, not, not really, but, you know, because like theoretically, if both functions are well established, there should be a lot more competitive information in battle cards than you'd expect to find in the positioning. So it should be flowing this way. Some companies might have a more established product marketing function and a newer CI function. So it might be more of a, more of a sort of iterative, uh, iterative flow, flow in both directions. Anyway, just fin final word on where you can go for more information on this before we go to the questions, which we're going to be ready for in just a second. So this is like an extract, if you like, of a, of a, of a bigger piece uh, of work that's available to you if you want for free um, on Product Marketing Hive. There's like a 20-page playbook. There's templates. There's all sorts of other stuff there. Uh, and I won't, I won't go on about that anymore. But that's, that's the... Uh, um, that's really what I wanted to say. So I'm looking forward to... I'm looking forward to... Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you for that, Crispin. That was uh, that was awesome. And yeah, the product marketing hive, the the content on there, 
is is really really good and the slack we'll send out a a link to the slack community too in the in the follow-up but yeah we can we can kind of get to some of the questions here i know one of the the first ones was related to when you were talking about the red ocean blue ocean segmenting mm -hmm. your audience do you see it as um would you recommend segmenting the audience out in terms of educating a cold market segment and then differentiating in your in your hot market? Yeah, so I mean, I I I, I would say that for for a given product, I mean, we should probably do this at the product level, but a, a given product is either in a hot market or a cold market. I don't think it can really be uh, be in between. Now, if you are if you're in a cold market, so if you're in a hot market, everything that we just said, right? is the way to handle it. In a cold market, what you need to do is much more um, subtle. Let's say, and, and you know, a good example of this, you know, that I've heard um, uh, from, uh, from a friend of mine would be, uh, which is Dave Kellogg, XML databases. You know, Dave had the pleasure of running a company that sold XML databases uh, for a while and nobody was buying them. Nobody wanted one. I mean, you could call people and say, hey, I've got an XML database. Yeah, pretty cool, huh? Would you want one? And they'd say, no, thank you. And, and, they'd, and they'd hang up because nobody wanted an XML database. Now, it turned out it could do useful things, but you couldn't sell it as, hey, I've got an XML database. It's better than the other XML databases because X, Y, Z, because nobody's looking for a database, an XML database, and no one cares why yours is better than theirs. So they would actually use a narrative instead, which is, hey, you know what? We've been working with some publishing companies like yours who are struggling with the transition from, you know, from, from paper to online, and they find that they need to do this, this, and this. And that's why we're working with Reed Elsevier on doing blah, blah using, by the way, in case you care, an XML database. So it's like, that's a, that's a narrative that sort of sets up a need for your product. In a hot market, you don't need to do that. You can use a narrative, but that's not what it's for. So I don't know if that answered the question. I hope so. That, that's great. I have another one here. I think it was, there wasn't as much context related to it. I'm just trying to pinpoint. I think it was related to this as well. Is there any difference if you're talking about messaging around a service rather than a product? Hmm. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's going to be some, some differences, I guess, but the same framework definitely works because I've used it quite a bit for services. Um, uh, so no, I mean, I, I think that you can, you can, yeah, you can apply, you can apply the same, the, the, the exact same framework. It, it, as far as I can tell, it doesn't seem to matter if it's a product or a service, certainly used it for a, for a, for a financial program. Uh, that, would, that would be sold by banks you know nothing to do with nothing to do with technology it doesn't seem to matter what do you do when the competition copies your differentiation so uh, if they've claimed it for their own even if it's not true or arguable yeah so this is great right so th that's a that's a that's a super good question and and so you know, let's say let's say you look at you look at a, a positioning statement like um you know, empathy is the commerce search and discovery platform you can trust. Okay, well, what's to stop everyone else in that space just starting to say trust, trust, trust? Here's the thing: you can't, you can't add, you can't add simplicity to something. So, so if if your messaging is super simple, you have you have one fundamental benefit in your positioning statement, and then you've got three messages. Yes, someone else could take anything that you've said and they could add it to what they have but that won't work because what they have could easily be already a mess. They could already be saying a lot more than four or five things. And now they're going to add, because the kind of company that would do this, that would just add it, they're, you know, they, they're going to add, they're going to add a couple more things. So now they used to be saying 10 things. Now they're saying 10 things plus trust. Is that going to work? Not really. It's not, it's not going to work for them very well. And, and, and because the, the, the reason, the reason this whole, this whole framework works, it's, it's the absence of the other stuff. It's, it's what you're not saying that makes what you're saying get through right? It's, it, so that's why you're just saying three things. Because if, cause, cause, you know, if, they, if those were three of 10 things, no one would ever know what they were. So, so, so the risk of being copied is, there is, of course, there is a risk, but, but, but to copy you in a very professional way, what they would have to do is throw out everything they had before and reposition themselves completely, you know, wipe out their web server and, and, and come up with something which was just as simple and just as clean as what you had. So, um, so I hope, I hope that's, that's at least a, at least a partial answer. Uh, another question here. Um, do, 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 do. If you're a software product company, can customer service, so an, having an awesome customer service, uh, post sales experience, can you use that 
as a differentiator? Is that a successful approach that you've seen in your in your career? Yeah, you can, uh, you can, but but you know, yes. So yes, and and so so the, the even the even bigger answer is that any anything that you offer customers can be part of your overall value proposition, right? It can be part of your message. It doesn't have to just be a product feature. Um, and, and, and when you're making claims, you can claim anything you want, right? So the, the key messages, those are claims, you can claim whatever you like. Now, you do need to be able to prove all of those claims in this framework, right? So as, so as long as you sort of respect my rules, which is that you, you can make any claim you like, you prove every claim you make, then you're good to go. In other words, um, if you say awesome customer service, you have to have data to back it up. You have mm -hmm. to have facts behind it. If you do have facts behind it, then yeah, totally. What, what, what would the fact look like? Is it, is it social proof? From um, like It would have to be, let's see, it, it could be, um, uh, let's say there's some kind of public, you know, public rating of service quality then that, that's available, like, a, you know, NPS. I mean, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want it to be something that only you had. So, so ideally, it would be like a third party satisfaction survey where you came out as number one. Uh, or if you don't have one of those, you commission one. And you make sure you come up as number one, or uh, you know, you, you hope you come out as number one. So yeah, it has to be facts. Yeah, exactly. That's, Someone's that's typing here. NPS. Yeah, that's C funny. It got it got in the in the chat box as. Yeah, as... yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if if you got the data, then totally. Yeah, people so, care, right? Uh, another question here is: so, do the uh, the approaches that you've explained do they work for a platform story instead of just a, a single product or solution, which is usually going to be more features and function based? Um, yes, yes, they they absolutely do, um, and um, I mean there are some there are some other considerations. Let's say you know if you if you have a platform, I mean there are, there are different variations of this, right? And, and we start to we might start to get into multi product marketing. You know you might have a platform and then you might have applications as well. But yes, it works. Um, it works. It works perfectly well for um, uh, for platforms. Um, it doesn't um, because platforms have features, right? It's like feature a feature is just is just a piece of a thing, right? A table has features. Right. Everything has, you know, if you, everything has features, right? Platforms have features. I mean, they, they, they have architectural features, like maybe it's a microservices based platform. Uh, they have they, they have capabilities which are exposed to the platform, which are features. So, yeah, it works. It absolutely works for platforms for sure. And, and many of the examples I gave are more sort of businessy software. And I'm not really sure why that is. This works just as well for, for you know, super technical uh, um, you know, software that's made for, for engineers or developers. It's exactly the same. Uh, another one here. Would you, would you do messaging and positioning differently for different markets? And the example they put in here is geographic. So if you had a US market versus APAC or EMEA. So mm. I'm not sure if they're talking about, I think for different markets, yeah, they're just talking about geographic here. Yeah. Um, no, uh, I wouldn't do them differently. And I, I've got a lot of experience on this as well. And, and um, yeah, I mean, so it's, you'll very often get your local marketing teams up saying, oh, no, no, that, that, you don't understand. That's not going to work in Germany. We can't have, you know, your brand can't be red. Everything has to be gray. Um, you know, <laughs> take out all the color or no, we'll buy it. Um, most, most of those sort of local, local variation claims are, uh, are not true. There, there are some cultural differences, and and and, and this is this is actually very important. Um, there are some cultural differences around around how you talk about the competition. Like places in the U.S. are very, you know, Oracle used to make huge billboards about why the competitors sucked. Right? It wasn't really considered. It's not considered to be particularly offensive in the U.S. to, you know, to, to 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 talk about how bad the competitors are and how great we are. That's a very American thing, right? Um, in France, for example, where I lived for a long time. Uh, I, I, as I remember, actually, Oracle came there and they did that, and, <laughs> and everyone was going, <laughs> "You know, why don't you talk about what you guys do? Because you know, uh, if we want to know what the other people do, we'll ask them." You know, so it's just like they, they, they don't want to hear that. It's just it's not culturally, it's not a fit. Now, what's really good with this framework is that you are landing competitive messages, but you're never saying the competitor sucks, right? If you, if you say that you know my my product is easy to use, you're not saying your competitor is hard to use. When you say that your, you know, your product is easy to deploy, you're not saying the competitor is hard to deploy, although you know that they are. So you're landing competitive messages in a very culturally acceptable way, right? That would, that would be perfectly acceptable anywhere in the world. And the difference is, I mean, I suppose if, if there's a tiny caveat to this is like, 
is the competition local, right? Because I'm I'm sort of assuming I'm assuming here that that, that we have that we're in we're in a sort of global. It's global companies competing against global companies, mm-hmm. in which case the messaging should be the same everywhere. If if you have a very local offering, um, and let's say either your offering is different locally or the com- competition is completely different locally, then you might need you might want to think about some ways to, to 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 hone that messaging a bit. And there are some markets which are very fragmented geographically, for example, sort of small business accounting, right? So there there are global players, but there are lots of local players. So that'd be my only. Uh, another one. So we have is, um, sorry, let me read this one here. Is verticalization of your product offering considered a differentiation? Um, I mean, not, not, not really because I mean, I think, okay. (laughs) So, so let me, let me, let me try, let me try this. So, um, so we need to differentiate between what we care about as the people who make the product versus what an individual buyer cares about, right? So an individual buyer is in, and I might change my mind as I answer the question. An, <laughs> indiv- an, an individual buyer is in one vertical, right? So, so let's say I'm an individual buyer, I'm in retail. Do I care that you have a retail offering? Yes, I do. Do I care that you have a financial services offering and you have four other vertical offerings? Not at all. So I don't, I don't care that you have multiple vertical offerings. I care that you have mine. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so, so that, so that's, so I don't know, I don't know if that answers the question. So it, it, it is, it is, it is, it, it does, it is an important differentiator if they happen to be in the right vertical. The trouble with vertical stuff in general is there's lots of them. There are so many verticals mm-hmm. is that, you know, the marketing lift you have to do if you want to go vertical in your marketing is tremendous because actually verticals end up breaking down into sub verticals and micro verticals and mini verticals. And there's just an endless list of them. And they all consider themselves to be rather different from each other. Right. So, but, you know, but some, some companies do end up having a micro vertical um, uh, approach and, you know, that can, that can work. Let's say, for example, uh, when I was at Microsoft, uh, we sold, business apps that went through channels and the channels, this, this was from, from, from an acquisition in, in, uh, uh, in, in Denmark called Navision and their strategy was micro vertical partners. They built half the product partner finished it. So we had a solution for Napa wineries, for example, or for uh, Dutch cookie bakers or for Finnish fish, fisheries, right? Those are all little micro vertical solutions. So if you're an Napa winery and someone says, Hey, I've got an Napa winery solution and your competitor who might be into it says, I have a solution for small business accounting. I mean, it's going to be much more compelling to get the Napa winery solution, right? If you're an Napa winery, because, you know, the person that knows all of your friends, like, you know, right. So, so yeah. So I think, I think verticalization is, is clever when you can do it. Um, I have, uh, there's a few more here. We've got, so a question here, how to deal with a uh, positioning statement to different stakeholders with different priorities. Um, that I'm not sure if there's any more context on that. I'm not sure if they're talking about positioning like this, if the product is serving different stakeholders with different priorities or if they have different products, but. Yeah. Um, I see. Yeah. To different. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it could be, um, it could be, it could be, the question might be about, uh, uh, about um, the, the, the customers, different customer stakeholders having different priorities, mm-hmm. or it could be an internal question. Um, the answer is kind of the same in, in, in both cases is, is that you've only got one of them. There's just one, there's just one positioning statement. And so your goal is always gonna to have to be to do the most good for the most people. So, so, so yes, um, there may, there's gonna be some, some, some customers out there where this statement is gonna resonate more and some customers where it's gonna resonate less. But what you're doing is, you know, you're doing product marketing. Um, and then hopefully later someone's going to get to do sales and when they get to do sales, then they can use all the battle cards, which are specific to their scenario and they, and they can, they can have a conversation with the customer and so on and they can get much more specific, but, but, you know, you can only do, you can, you can only do what you can do. I think, um, if it's, if it's about internal stakeholders and their priorities being different. Yeah. I mean, that's why, that's why these, it's, it's such a, uh, it's such, it's, it's such a project to actually get, you know, get, get this work done. And, you know, my advice to anyone thinking about this is don't try this alone. Don't try, don't try to sit at a desk and do this work for your product. Get people together, get the, get the key stakeholders who might disagree into a room and, and sit them down and have them argue about it for four or five hours, which they might well do. And it might well, by the way, lead to some very interesting strategy conversations that have nothing to do with what you're trying to do, <laughs> but, but, but it's probably very good for them uh, to have those conversations that, 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 that have been waiting. 
All right, we're coming up to a time crunch here. I we've still got quite a few questions left. Uh, if anyone else has some questions, quick fire them fire them our way now, or shoot me a message later. And we can, we can try to get to as many as possible because I don't want to take up any more of Crispin's or everyone else's time here. But I do think there's been some really good questions and follow ups on this. Uh, so yeah, send them send them my way, uh, Adam McQueen at clue.com or shoot it to to whoever on the clue team and we'll, we'll get to them. One of the last questions as well, we had, uh, do you need just one battle card per product or is it multiple? Uh, we've done a ton of webinars already on, on battle card content too. So I can send them your way to the person that asked that question, but yeah, we've, we've got a few more. We'll try to get to them, but I don't want to take up any more time of your time here, Crispin. Uh, this was this was great. Loved the conversation. This is uh, a really really well put together slide deck too. So the presentation will be going out to everyone that's attended, um, and the recording will also be sent through. So yeah, make if you have any other questions as well, feel free to reach out, and we'll make sure that we can answer as many questions as possible. But thank you everyone for your time. Great, thank you, Adam. <laughs>